AMD Ryzen Threadripper 2950X and 2990WX reviewed NVIDIA's consumer GPUs. That's next week, but we got RTX Tesla Core info now. Intel's latest bargain SSD and so many hacks from DEF CON. All that and more coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 479, recorded on August 16th, 2018. AMD Threadripper Reviewed. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Introducing Rate Shield Approval. If you're in the market to buy a home, Rate Shield Approval locks up your rate for up to 90 days while you shop. It's a real game changer. Learn more and get started at rocketmortgage.com slash twit. Welcome to Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, Twitch weekly show that aims to bring you the most useful, most delightful, most engaging, most informative, most... Uh, there's a laundry list of stuff we usually do here, but let's just say we got a ton of news. It's about hardware. It's about desktops and consoles and mobile. Oh, my. And ladies and gentlemen, joining us today, Mr. Ryan Shrout from beautiful Florence, Kentucky, who I understand has a functioning Tesla, unlike one of his friends who has a malfunctioning <laughs> Tesla. How are you, sir? I mean... Uh, I'm good. Yeah. I mean, the other one is it's functioning. It just, it has malfunctions, right? Right. But that's, you know, that's not my point, problem. That's somebody else's problem. At some point, <laughs> as soon as you get to sort of 44 out of the first, you know, 200 days of ownership, it's spending in the shop. You know, to me, that sounds like a lemon law return, but, you know. It would uh, have been if you had bought it from the manufacturer. Um, well, there's one thing to yeah. do. Given that you are in Kentucky, I say you put it in a parking lot, $5 for every hit with a sledgehammer, <laughs> put it on a 24-hour YouTube and Twitch stream, and watch the fur fly. I suggest at that point, Elon Musk himself will show up in an attempt to rescue. Oh, that's hardware. a good plan. I bet I bet he would. <laughs> yeah. If I could just have the battery and the motor Actually. out of it first. <laughs> it's not a horrible idea. Yeah, I would take the expensive stuff out that is that is worthwhile. But <clears throat> okay, I'll, I'll put it on the I'll put it on the table for him. Yeah, we'll yeah, yeah I can call him later just to hear the frothing <laughs> over the phone because some people froth over. Don't the Don't distract phone. him. He's got a lot of stuff to do. And it's okay. I'll stop now. <laughs> Obviously, there are reviews with a certain type coming in the near future. Um, we should we should start. We. Uh, uh, Kyle was on from Hardware CP last week. We we sort of tiptoed around the stuff he could discuss with Threadripper that wasn't uh, under NDA at that point. Um, you know, Ken, for his sins, was tasked with benchmarking the Threadripper 2950X and 2990WX. Um, you know, I, I, I feel comfortable in saying at this point after talking with, with Kyle last week that the WX is not only outrageously expensive, but really is something that is for... Uh, people that are doing workstation class, high power workstation class stuff, uh, and or just have yeah. stacked amounts of money to burn. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I, you know, I bet it's, it's, uh, you know, you're talking about how much for that processor. So the, the 2990 WX is 1799. That's the 32 core 64 thread part. <clears throat> Honestly, it's the one that in the build up to this launch that was the most interesting and exciting, right? It was the it was where all the rumors coming of AMD doubling the core count again from from 16 to 32. And what what nobody really realized until we started to get briefed by AMD on this is that it there's a lot of complication that goes along with it, right? There are uh, uh, complications of using the same socket and the same motherboards means that even though you have four dies with four separate memory controllers, you can only access two of them. Even though right. all four dies have access to PCI Express lanes, you only can access two sets of those. Uh, unlike where these 32 core processors exist in the Epic platform, you know, they have eight channel memory support, 128 lanes of PCIe support. Uh, the Threadripper versions have about half that. But maybe more problematic for the part is that when you start to branch outside of the truly multi-thread capable, truly like workstation class applications, your, your, your offline rendering, mm -hmm. your ray tracing, your uh, video production, stuff like that, you start to find a lot of instances where the processor actually is going to run slower than the 16-core mm -hmm. part, uh, like gaming, for example. Even in some um, older 
uh, handbrake encoders, right? If you're just doing a single instance of those applications. And the reason is that the because two of the two sets of eight cores, right? Remember, there's four separate die on these parts. Um, two of those don't have access to memory. They don't have access to PCIe off of their own uh, silicon. So right. they have to hop across to the other one. And when you have threads that are, you know, some threads that maybe the Windows scheduler isn't intelligently placing and, and they're, you know, maybe a, it, the worst case scenario is you've got a, a core that has no memory trying to talk with a thread with the other core that has no memory and they both have to go to separate cores in order for these, uh, for the data to copy over and transmit and communicate. So there, there are instances where that happens. I don't think that makes the 2990 WX a bad part. It just means mm -hmm. that you need to be more deliberate about what you're buying it for. Uh, right. If you're if you're an enthusiast and you love the idea of having 32 cores, but really you're doing gaming most of the time and 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 some moderate prosumer workloads, you probably don't want to go down that route. Just because every time you game, if you want the best experience possible for the gaming uh, uh, scenarios, you're going to have to uh, enter into game mode, which is something the previous the first gen Threadripper have, but that essentially disables half your cores or disables three quarters of your cores, puts you into an eight or 16 core system, which removes a lot of those uh, uh, bottlenecks or potential problems in performance. But it does mean mm -hmm. you have to reboot machine to get into that mode. And then if you're going to do work again and you want access to all 64 threads, you reboot again. Um, and then I can imagine some scenarios if you're lazy like me, where you'd be like, yeah, this project's only going to take 20 minutes to render anyway. I'll just leave it in 16 core mode so I don't have to close all these apps and reboot. You, you kind of lose some of the some of the benefit there. So the the W in that brand, the 2990WX, is mm -hmm. I think more important than AMD emphasized, right? Like the Threadripper brand right. at the beginning, it's called Ryzen, it's called Threadripper. Maybe this should have been called something like Epic W, like for Epic Workstation, uh, and it would have gotten more of that uh, emphasis placed I mean, they on could the branding. Have named it the 2900 or the 2990 workstation processor that's going to create problems for you in certain workloads if you're a consumer that just wanted to spend all the money. But that was yep. tough to fit on the box. Um. <laughs> yep, yep. And on the other side, the 2950X, which is the 16-core part, the analog to the 1950X, uh, is now 899 So it's 100 bucks less uh, of starting MSRP. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can get the 1950X for below that now. Um, it's 16 cores, 32 threads, higher clock speeds, but beyond just higher clock speeds uh, by a couple hundred megahertz, it has Precision Boost 2. It has all the Zen Plus design changes, and Precision Boost 2 is actually more valuable to the 2950 than it is to the 2700X because basically the old version of Precision Boost was if you're using one or two cores, the clock speed just kind of w was at its near its top speed. And as soon as you went to like three, four, five cores, the clocks dropped pretty, pretty quickly. Uh, there was a pretty high or steep shelf there. Now it's a much more gradual change. So, you know, if you're, if you're using eight, 10 threads throughout your system, you can expect higher average clock speeds than you would have. Otherwise the latency improvements that you got with the Zen plus are carried over to this. And it, it does, there are many instances in which the 2950X 16 core part from AMD is now matching or near matching and in a couple of cases better than the 7980XE from Intel, which is the 18 core part um, Skylake X. No. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, uh, but, but it does that even though, you know, we know that the inherent IPC advantages belong, belong to Intel in that space. And that right. 7980XE is still like $2,000 part. So uh, I, I still think that the second gen Threadripper launch is good. Like these are good products, uh, but I think there's mm -hmm. a little bit more confusion and a there needs to be a little bit more deliberate discussion about the difference between the X series and the WX series than maybe we right. had we thought we were going to have to have. At some level, is there going to need to be optimization in some applications to take advantage of this this uh, excess of cores, if you will? Um, because <laughs> I mean, when it's really going to be at the OS level. Yeah, that's what I'm. Or at the, at the so it's more the OS than the actual applications themselves. Yeah, I mean, so so here's the thing. Like the the AMD tried to make this as good as possible. So if you look at the 2990, it's it's separated into four NUMA nodes, right? So mm -hmm. four different memory segments. And in theory, Windows should uh, 
should only should place threads on the cores that have access to memory first. So they they put those, you know, that's node zero and node one uh, before it goes into node two and three that ha don't have access to memory. Um, it doesn't work perfectly in Windows 10 today. It may work a little bit better in Windows Server than it does in Windows 10. Right. The but th there's still a lot of room for fixes in that. There's still a lot of room to optimize. There's room to, um, you know, give the operating system a little bit more of a peek inside the architecture so it knows these types of things. I could also imagine um, what I would like to see is for for some applications, say the operating system doesn't really change and the applications... Um, some of them can be complicated, like say games, for example, right? Like, you know, games mm -hmm. are going to create a whole bunch of threads. They may not uh, be aware enough to say, make sure I'm always on the same NUMA node or what have you. The right. If there was a piece of software that you could, you know, it, this is an extra step that you don't want to have to do, but as like kind of an interim step, if you open up this piece of software and say, every time I start Far Cry 5, it only has access to these eight cores, right? If you could do that and have it have it automatically set the affinity of that application that way, that would help a lot. Uh, and I think I mean, it's something AMD is aware of, but I think it's just a really complex software problem to solve uh, when you're not the developer of the OS and or all of those applications that you're trying to fix. All you have to do is fix everything yeah. everywhere simultaneously <laughs> before For it everybody ships. else. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's interesting looking at, at some of the benchmarks where, you know, it goes from having this staggering lead um, you know, it, you know, POV Ray 3.7.0, um, where it's not quite, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, not quite twice as fast as a Core i9 7980XE, but it's, you know, in the neighborhood. Um, and then you keep scrolling down, like, you know, uh, in Blender, lower is better, and POV Ray, uh, larger is better. And, you know, that's a pretty significant lead. Uh, you know, and then you get to sort of, you know, X two six four benchmark uh, X two six four benchmark five point zero dot one, and the Threadripper twenty nine fifty X is actually outperforming the Threadripper twenty nine ninety W X, um, despite having half the number of cores. And it's a really interesting, like, oh, oh, there are issues yeah. there. How thrilling! Mm -hmm. um, you know, is was gaming just kind of silly to do on this? Was there any point? Because I, I, most games are still like, I still feel like a quad core game is kind of like something to celebrate, um, which is not, you know, a, a last year, probably a quad core game was something to celebrate. I think they're becoming yeah. more common now, but, um, you know, uh, it was, was it just a ridiculous tool for gaming? I mean, it, it, the 2950 X was still, was still better, right? The 20, there are some games where the 2990 and you'll see for the 2990 WX, there's two data points. There's the default uh, and then there's the gaming mode where we took it down to eight cores. And in some instances, like Wildlands there, uh, if you remember back to the original Threadripper launch, there were some games that right. just wouldn't start if you had too many threads. Wildlands is right. one of those. It works now with a 16 core. doesn't work with the 32 core. So, you know, still <laughs> a little bit more modifications to go. There are some games with the 2990 and the 2950 <laughs> are neck and neck. There are some where right. without the gaming mode enabled, the 2990 is, you know, half the speed or significantly slower. And that's all because of the the latency issues that come up across right. threads that aren't on the same Newman node trying trying to communicate. So yeah, GTA Part 5 is, is one of those examples, right? So you can see the 2990 only pulls in 45 frames per second, but when you turn on game mode, that jumps up to 94, uh, right. which is obviously a huge difference. Uh, you don't Part have to worry about that as much with the 2950. Part of this makes me laugh is this is such an example of, you know, there are games that really aren't CPU bound and Boy, what a demonstration! Uh, especially like Civilization VI, um, <laughs> where where obviously CPU power is not the challenge there. I mean, it's you know, technically the the thread rippers uh, were faster, but you're still talking about a variation from twelve point eight on a Ryzen 7 2700 X uh, up to fourteen point nine uh, frames per second. Um, that's not a huge delta given the price difference in the range of parts on that screen. Um, more so on the GPU side of things. But it's, you know, uh, I, I've never actually had a chance to say horses for courses out loud on a podcast ever. <laughs> so you heard it here first, but this is really, you know, this is not the horse for that course. Um, 
you know, gaming is an afterthought on this. Uh, you know, a well, actually, a well thought out afterthought on this, given that they put the gaming mode in there. But um, yeah. I also love the. Uh, uh, if you go to the the last page, the overclocking section, the software. Um, <laughs> Where it's showing the the Ryzen Master overclocking software in place. Keep scrolling. Keep scrolling. There it is. Click on that one. You know, in case you're wondering what a visual uh, look at 32 <laughs> cores <laughs> looks like. Yeah. That it's a little bit of data me. overload, huh? Just a little bit. Yeah. Just a little bit. That's just a lot of cores, people. I, I you know, I, 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 I've... I, Thumbs up. I mean, you know, it's it's it didn't win the. It's it, it's funny because like the twenty eight fifty X got an editor's choice. The twenty nine ninety WX got a, a silver award. Um, you know, I, I mean, I I think you you know you know who you are uh, if you need right. a twenty nine ninety WX, uh, and if you aren't thinking like this will solve this problem in my office and I will be able to take lunch breaks once again and leave. <laughs> Before midnight, <laughs> right? That's your point. Yep. Um, if you're thinking like Warcraft would be totally bitching on this, it is not your part, uh, and yep. you should donate that money to a, a worthy charity. Um, interesting stuff. Interesting stuff. Yep. Will you be buying a uh, 2990 WX for use in the office? <sighs> um, that was a big sigh. I don't. I don't know. It... <sighs> I mean, so I, I, honestly, the the software we use, Adobe, doesn't utilize it as well as it should, right? right. And that, that's a reason why we switch from a two-socket Xeon server to a one-socket 18-core 7980XE when we did. Um, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't do as well with the Numa node problems, which is which are the right. same problems that exist when you switch when you go to multi-socket configurations too. So um, I want to see some more software optimization on that side. Uh, but, you know, I think a 2950X would probably be something that I would consider putting in there because it, you can put it on one NUMA mode, new one node, uh, unified memory address space, and then it has higher clock speeds and all the latency efficiency improvements to go along with it. That's probably where yeah. I'd go. Yeah, seems sensible. Um, while you're contemplating it, because I know some of you out there are thinking, I wonder how it does overclocking. Can we get it that, can we, I just want the single core performance to be better than Intel's. Um, <laughs> Roland Moore, Roland Moore Coiler, uh, Collier, pardon me, uh, over at uh, the Inquirer.net is a, a nice write-up. Uh, Ambi Thread of Roland Moore Collier over at the Inquirer.net has a great write-up. AMD Threadripper 2990WX overclocked to 6 gigahertz across all 32 cores. And before you start salivating, guess what? It took liquid nitrogen. Big shock there. Um, yeah. Yeah. Indonesian overclocker Ivan Kupa is the overclocker in question. Uh, liquid nitrogen and the MSI MEG X99 creation motherboard to get AMD's high-end enthusiast chip to hit 5.955 gigahertz. Let's just call it 6 gig across every single core in the processor, unquote. Um, <laughs> you know, obviously not practical for everyday use, but uh, that's some pretty crazy performance. Yep. Also, gotta love the, if you're watching the video, uh, there's giant plumes of nitrogen blowing out the fan, and uh, it's a beast. What uh, I mean, what can we expect for human overclocking using uh, reasonable liquid cooling or, or, or air cooling on that, on that system? Uh, air cooling, I, I wouldn't really bother, bother, especially if you're looking at the 32 core stuff. The, the They do have, we didn't talk about it in this review, the Wraith Ripper, which is that giant air cooler they built for it. We have another story that's going to go up that looks at some of the performance differences there. Uh, Ken was able to get uh, all 40, all 40, all 64 threads, all 32 cores at 4.1 gigahertz uh, with the temperatures staying under 670 degrees Celsius. We were using a, an Intermax all-in-one water cooler that was a full coverage uh, water block on it. 20% um, increase in performance over stock clocks. But keeping in mind that system power, total system power jumped mm -hmm. from 387 watts at stock to 620 watts when overclocked running Cinebench. So that's a 233 watt increase. 
<laughs> over uh, over over stock. That's 233 additional watts being drawn by the processor and motherboard power delivery systems. So, as mom would some, say, have some good cooling along the way. Impressive. <laughs> <laughs> have a lot have all the cooling if you've been looking for an excuse for that uh, ginormous cooling system um, that's the uh, that's the excuse yep. right there Asus Pro Art PA 32 UC 32 inch monitor 4k UHD HDR for the professionals um, this is I mean this is really interesting for me to read uh, Ken did the write-up on this one um, so if you've ever looked at uh, this is something that comes up occasionally uh, because Robert, my my partner in crime on AV Excel, uh, he calibrates monitors for a living, uh, usually home theater stuff, but it's a, a fair amount of professional stuff too. And what's crazy is when you when you walk into a, a video production house, for example, um, they may have a half a dozen reference monitors from Sony, uh, and those uh, it's funny because. Ken says reference displays that can cost upwards of twenty thousand. I, I know Robert's run into several Sony monitors that that cost thirty thousand, and uh, he's very gentle when he's plucking in the cables into those um, because <laughs> you know that's uh, that's an expensive uh, that's an expensive thing to have to replace. Um, yep. You know this is I don't know how excited I am about like ninety nine point five percent Adobe RGB coverage. Uh, but it's a 32 inch IPS panel, 85% Rec 2020, which is pretty good. 99.5% um, Adobe RGB, over 95% DCI P3, and 100% RS RGB. Um, those last two are, are, are getting a little more common. Uh, 4K, 5 millisecond grade to grade response time, supports HDR10, and has a peak brightness of 1,000 candelas per meter square, which is good. Um, Very good. It's extremely good for a desktop monitor. And uh, uh, the price on this, uh, and oh, I also want to point out that this uh, relatively tiny monitor, um, and this is actually really impressive. This is a 32 inch panel, uh, has 384 zones and a full array local dimming uh, backlight, and that's uh, that's kind of unheard of uh, in most monitors. So that gives you a huge amount of control over the peak brightness, and I think it's also flat out why they can get it that bright because that's to put that in perspective a 55 inch tlc flat panel is running 96 zones uh that's kind of like the 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 tcl mm. 55 inch tcl uh the r6 series uh and i think they go up to 128 for the 65 inch panel uh this is half the size of the 65 inch panel uh and is running more than twice as many zones inside of there um you know. It is. It is the same. It. I think it's the same backlight configuration as right. the ASUS uh, G Sync HDR display. It also had a 384 mm -hmm. zone backlight, thousand nits max brightness. This is obviously limited to uh, a 60 hertz refresh, whereas um, the G Sync display panel could go up to 98 you know, at full color reproduction mode. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's. Uh, I thought it was interesting. Did they not care about uh, uh, getting certified, VESA certified for this? I thought that was kind of interesting. Oh, like display HDR one thousand mm -hmm. whatever. Yeah, I guess they yeah. didn't. They didn't do that. Uh, or, I mean, this monitor was announced a little while ago, quite a bit ago. Um, maybe Computex knows before that. I think too. So I don't know if maybe right. they just didn't do it or that was such a new thing they didn't do it but yeah I, you would have thought that was something they would have they would have included yeah. it does have a uh, pretty high quality stand based on what ken has yeah. said it does support thunderbolt as well as it's got three or four hdmi ports on it and display port of course to go along with it so the thunderbolt supports kind of nice it will charge your laptop if you hook it up to it and you can use the usb ports as the hub and and everything as well and uh you know the 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 G Sync HDR monitor obviously has the advantage of it being a gaming monitor. It's got the variable refresh capability. This this does support adaptive sync, but it's not FreeSync branded either. You know they wanted ASUS, right. I think, with this ProArt series, wanted to keep it separate from the professional line, from the gaming line. Uh, but this is also five inches larger display, right? This is a 32 inch right. diagonal panel as opposed to the G Sync, which is a 27 inch panel and that that's it's a pretty big difference when you've got the monitors kind of sitting side by side it's uh it, it is uh uh it is actually uhd ultra hd premium certified 
um, which I yeah. thought was interesting because that's more of a television uh, television certification that I don't know. You know, it's funny because it's something that I don't think I've ever heard anyone talk about uh, in the real world. But uh, I'm also laughing because it's like, you know, features overview, high dynamic range, wider color spectrum, 4K Ultra HD resolution, and color bit depth are the features overview. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> Ooh, color bit depth, my favorite. Yeah. But if you if you dig into the four point type at the very bottom of the extremely uh, shallow definition of high dynamic range, to bear the Ultra HD Premium logo, brightness and black level performance must range from either a minimum of 0.05 to 1,000 nits or 0.005 to 540 nits. Um, so, you mm-hmm. know. Uh, Signal input must use BT2020 color representation with a display reproduction of more than 90% of P3 colors. That's actually pretty good. Um, yeah, it's it's just a very funny... Uh, <laughs> to bear the Ultra HD Premium logo, device manufacturers must meet a minimum display resolution of 3840 by 2160 pixels. I have a feeling that this is a group of manufacturers that put this together. Uh, a minimum 10-bit <laughs> color depth must be supported. Um, it's interesting. Did... did uh, Ken mentioned if it has uh, support. It's HDR10. Uh, I assume mm-hmm. not Dolby Vision. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Interesting product. Oh my goodness! And a lot less than a traditional uh, certified monitor. Uh, yeah, perhaps because it's not quite as over the top in its certification. Um, <laughs> Intel SSD 660P, one terabyte SSD review, QLC goes mainstream. Was there gnashing of teeth or uh, joy from Mr. Malventano when he was beaten I on think, this one? I um, think positive, right? So the whole idea of QLC is that uh, you're getting more data in the same die space than you would get before. And that diagram at the top kind of shows you SLC versus MLC versus TLC and now QLC uh, as the name would apply quad. So you're, you're getting 33% more bits per cell compared to TLC, which is obviously a cost reduction. Um, you know, you're getting, you're getting more capacity in the same physical silicon size. The, the complication of QLC and this is something that everybody always knew is that as, as you make those, peaks and valleys uh, more narrow in that diagram, it becomes more difficult to accurately write to the data, to program the flash, essentially. So you've got a, the, the writing is slow on QLC, just like it was slower going from SLC to MLC to TLC to QLC, it, the, the writing gets slower. Now, the way that Intel is getting around this with their 660p drives is that they're using an SLC cache. And it's a dynamic cache that adjusts based on how much free space is on the drive and how big the capacity of the drive is itself. Um, if you get the maximum two terabyte drive and it's you know less than 25% full, Intel says you're going to have 280 gigabytes of SLC configured flash, which is a lot, right? And also kind of, mm-hmm. you know, it's basically shifting the way it's writing to that, to that memory as you go. Uh, so the SLC cache is what makes up for the slow write speed. The read speeds from QLC flash is fine, right? It's it's a little bit slower, but it's it's still really good, and you're going to be able to get NVMe speeds out of it. So the the secret for QLC, and will, will probably be the secret for all QLC implementations, is is having some sort of of dedicated cache or dynamic cache along with it to make up for the slower writes. And what the Intel 660P does is it. When you're writing to it, it fills up that cache. And then in the background, it does a process called folding, where it basically converts the SLC, uh, copies it to, it's going to convert SLC to QLC and then copy that data to it, right? And it will do that in the background during idle periods, or it will do it while you're copying data over as well. So um, the, the question mark that you have then is, what happens when you run out of cache? Or will you run out of of cache? And if you run out of SLC cache, which can happen, um, then you will reduce that to QLC write speeds, which are like 50 to 100 megabytes per second, right? Maybe, maybe, you know, basically you're kind of looking at hard drive speeds at Mm -hmm. that point, right? Um, Right. But the amount of writing you have to do to get to that is fairly substantial. Um, 
you know, talking 60, 70 gigs of writing on the one terabyte drive. If you, you have to do 60 or 70 gigs of sustained writes at full speed in order to fill that cache to the point where you would be reduced down to um, the, the QLC write speed. So it's a concern for, you know, if you're if you're doing a mass copy over for the first time or uh, uh, something like that. But in general usage, can you tell me the number of times that you've ever written 50 gigabytes of data at one time from a fast source at that too? Like if you're copying it from a hard drive over to your SSD, it's only going to be running at, you know, 100, 150 megabytes per second, maybe 200 megs per second, in which case it will take a lot longer to to fill up that cache because of the, the background <laughs> conversion and folding. Um, right. It's, I mean, it's, I've, it's I've an interesting thing. 12, I mean, I've, I've easily written... 100 gigabytes in a day um but you know <laughs> a how are we defining day, fast yeah. and yeah but uh i think the largest single file i've copied is 30 40 gigabytes um, yeah yeah with any degree of regularity you know it's right. not something i do a lot i mean the only about the only time I, I move a file that big is say an iso of a blu-ray yeah. um because i just don't run into a lot of even with the video production it's it, most of our stuff is compressed so we're not dealing with you know massive two yep. three hundred gigabyte files so so the, the, the promise of the drive from intel when, when we started talking to them about it was really NVMe level performance at SSD level pricing, and that and they and they did get that. It's not as fast as a 970 Pro, but it's within striking distance of it. It is noticeably faster than SATA SSDs. Uh, if you look at pricing, they're looking at 20 cents per gig, starting out MSRP on this, and that's really where you start to understand the value of what QLC could bring. You can get a one terabyte drive for $200 now or a two right. terabyte drive for 400 bucks or 512 gigs, your boot drive for a hundred dollars. Um, and yeah, you can find SATA drives cheaper than that today. You can find the Micron 1100 or the crucial MX 500, I think for, you know, a little bit less than this, 10 bucks, 20 bucks less uh, mm -hmm. on the 512 gig capacity or what have you. But you, you, the NVMe speed and the advantages there are real. Uh, and as long as you don't have any incredibly extreme storage write workloads, right. the, the caching system that they've built and uh, configured for this drive seems to be more than capable of handling consumer tasks. Don't put this in a server where it's going to be sustained writing <laughs> all day, every day. That would be a bad sign. They have different drives for that. This is this is targeted at at the specific consumer. And I think, you know, Alan and I did some did some testing. He did some measurements and, you know, like a Windows install with uh, what did he have here? Windows plus Office plus drivers is about twenty five gigabytes of writes to a drive. Mm -hmm. So and that's unless you know unless if um, until you install Doom the first time you download Doom from Steam, right? right. Like that's going to be a significant amount of, of your rights that you're going to have. These drives do have lower endurance ratings, like total like petabytes or uh, terabytes written. Um, but the, I think what is, uh, you could write for the 512 gig part, you could write 50 gigs per day every day for five years, which is a, the five year warranty before you'd hit the uh, terabyte written, um, rating of, of this drive. So like the ter the, the endurance is lower, the right, the raw write speed of QLC is lower. They make up for it with SLC cash and the dramatic cost and price drop is, uh, is substantial. What are these going to, when are these actually going to go on sale? Uh, they're already for sale. The, um, uh, well, let's see the five twelve I was able to find for sale, mm -hmm. um, at new egg, but it was like $5 over MSRP. Right. Um, but uh, uh, they're 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 creeping out now. They're supposed to be. This was a this was a live release. It's not a, not a September or October launch or right. anything like that. Just kind of waiting for them to show up at the at the right channels. And we should also point out um, that this is dangerously close to the Shroud standard of SSD <laughs> pricing, uh, which Mr. Shroud, if you are new to 
uh, <laughs> this week in computer hardware, Twitch is the name of our podcast, twit.tv slash Twitch, if you've never heard it before and you want to find more of us or the links to subscribe. Um, you know, you've been pushing for a good 10 cents a gigabyte price uh, for not quite as long as I've known you, since SSDs were quite <laughs> rightfully ridiculously expensive uh, a thousand years ago when we started doing this. But this is 20 cents uh, a gig. And, uh, you know, you're talking mm -hmm. about a, 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 you know, $400 two terabyte drive, which is not that much more than I paid for a one terabyte drive, um, uh, you know, a year and a half, two years ago. So this is, this is a big bump. Um, you know, you're talking about a, a, a legit usable $200 one terabyte hard drive from what I will affectionately call, uh, and you know, people at Intel are cringing right now if they listen to the podcast because there hasn't been a lot of affection from you or I directed at Intel in the last few months. But um, I, I can affectionately call this a reputable manufacturer of storage uh, technologies because a lot of the bargain storage devices are not what you would call uh, to awesome. Yeah, looks like the only one out there right now is that 512 gigabyte PCI Express, um, $104.99, which is not a bad deal. Nope. It's five dollars over MSRP, but it's still <laughs> still a good price. And you know, and now that I look at it, Crucial's MX five hundred one terabyte is down to hundred and eighty two dollars and sixty two cents. Um yep. <laughs> I should ask Alan if I should get the MX five hundred before I should wait for the the one terabyte six sixty P because you know, answering my irritating product purchasing questions brings him so much joy. <laughs> oh my goodness. I'm not going to say it's going to bring you joy because that would be kind of tough. Um, but let me remind you that this episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Brian's bought several properties because he's a wild man. And uh, uh, I have bought one. I'm not going to say it was emotionally traumatic and painful, um, but, you know, it was intense. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's an intense thing to buy a piece of property, especially if a mortgage is attached to it. And, uh, you know, right now, rising interest rates, people are nervous, um, you know, because forever it was just like, eh, mortgages cost nothing. They're going to stay costing nothing. Don't worry about it. But now there's a lot of unpredictability when it comes to buying a home. And uh, anxiety, I think, is a good word for how people are feeling when they look at a, at a, at a mortgage and buying a home. And uh, our friends at Quicken Loans, they're doing something about that. They're calling it the power buying process. And let me tell you how it works. Quicken Loans, they're going to verify your income, your assets, your credit, less than 24 hours to give you a verified approval, which you know gives you the strength of a cash buyer. Once you're verified, you qualify for their all-new exclusive rate shield approval. So they're going to lock up your rate for up to 90 days while you shop. The best part, if rates go up, your rate stays the same. But if rates go down, they'll drop your rate. Either way, you win. Your rate's not going to go up. If the market shifts so that the rates go down, they'll drop your rates. I mean, it's the kind of thinking you'd expect from America's largest mortgage lender. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash twit. Rate shield approval is only valid on certain 30-year purchase transactions. Additional conditions or exclusion may apply based on Quicken Loans data in comparison to public data records. Equal housing lender license in all 50 states. NMLS Consumer Access number 3030. That's rocketmortgage.com slash twit. And we want to thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans for their support of twit and this weekend computer hardware. I like the idea that even if interest rates go up, you're staying stable. Rocketmortgage.com slash twit. We want to thank them for their support of this week in computer hardware. And uh, it's exciting buying a house. Try to make the mortgage part of it as, you know, non-traumatic as possible. Uh, I did not see this coming. I'm sure Ryan saw this coming because Ryan knows all and sees all in the world of graphics. Uh, that uh, NVIDIA announced the Turing GPU architecture at SIGGRAPH 2018. This is all the professional parts, the uh, workstation parts, the kind of parts you would plug into a AMD Ryzen Threadripper 2990WX in a real use of it, not a gaming use of it. Uh, and ironically, uh, I, uh, I know someone who I make a show called Tech Thing with who will be in Germany when the consumer announcements come out on this. Um, this is pretty crazy. Um, are you excited about this architecture? 
Do you get excited about new arch? Of course you do. I mean, uh, yeah. you live for a new architecture. <laughs> this, this, yeah, no, you're right. This is, um, this is really cool. Uh, I, I, there's there's some fundamental things that that happen here, right? They they they're using the RTX brand, right? This to be fair, it's Quadro RTX. We right. don't know for sure if it's going to be GeForce RTX, but all the rumors and indications are that they will. And the reason they do that is the RTX is the technology that they used or that they announced uh, last March, I guess, for like ray tracing. Extent it was the ray tracing extension, the platform that they built. Um, that at the time was only running on on Volta architecture parts, mm -hmm. and now the the Turing architecture has it has your traditional CUDA cores, it has um, tensor cores in it for AI processing, and it has these new RT cores for ray tracing that do the traversal traversal mechanic, the traversal computation of a ray tracing hierarchy, hierarchy like memory platform. Um, the tensor cores are there to do any kind of AI inference, but the thing that, that they're most known for, at least initially right now, is AI denoising, which is used to mm -hmm. take, they, have, they already kind of showed this in the professional spaces where they take a ray traced image and they apply a denoising effect that is trained by uh, AI systems to make it clean, right? To, to make it a, a non-noisy image. And they can do the, all this in real time as well, right? And so this can apply mm -hmm. for, obviously, at SIGGRAPH, they're talking about professional applications, they're talking about, you know, uh, RenderMan, they're talking about all, all of the professional tools um, that, that, that developers use and Quadro users are, are used to working with. But also, we're interested in what this is going to be, be for gaming, right? Epic was there. Mm -hmm. They showed Unreal Engine integrated with RTX in March. Now they've showed it here. They showed uh, the same Stormtrooper, the shiny Stormtrooper demo uh, that they showed in March. But instead of running on four Quadro uh, GV100s, Volta V100 GPUs, it's running on a single Quadro RTX 6000 part. Um, so, you know, that's impressive that they're able to go from four GPUs to one with this. Um, they're there's a lot of interesting stuff here, and I'll be very, very curious what NVIDIA is willing to say, what they do say next week about how this translates over into consumer into consumer markets, if it does at all, right? Like, I mean, it's clearly right. going to. They announced ray tracing for real-time gaming. It makes sense that their high-end graphics cards would have the ray tracing cores, the RT cores in them. There's a possibility that only the top end parts have the tensor cores and the RT cores mm -hmm. and maybe your, you know, your 1160s, your 1060s, whatever they're going to be, don't have that. Um, there'd be interesting delineation between them. Maybe those still are branded GTX and only the high ends are branded RTX. Hmm. It's, uh, it's an odd place that we're going to be in with all of this. Um, and, and the Quadro line is just kind of the, the tip of the iceberg, right? Um, right. And it's a huge, if you look at, at that, that second story that you brought up, there's the two die side by side. The one on the right, clearly bigger. And even though, you know, they've kind of divided it, NVIDIA has divided it between, looks like 50% shaders and compute, 50, 25% RT, 25% tensor. Nobody would actually commit to me that that's actually the die space allocation for all of these subsystems. Um, so I, I am curious if we get a little bit more information about what the die costs for some of these features are. Sure. And, you know, NVIDIA is an interesting spot where they're, they're, they're the leader in all these spaces. If you look at professional visualization, you look at gaming, you know, PC gaming, if you look at uh, uh, enterprise level GPU computing, whether it be for AI or other purposes, they're in the leading position in all this. And rather than just say, I don't know, we're going to go from... 3,000 shaders to 6,000 shaders to 9,000 shaders over the course of this over this time period, they've gone a different direction. They've started implementing the AI processing in it. Now they're implementing the ray tracing stuff in it. So they're kind of, mm -hmm. they're not just making, they're not just getting better at graphics. They're kind of changing the direction that, that the graphics systems are doing, that the graphics ecosystem is doing, right? It's not a coincidence that NVIDIA is making this GPU at the same time that Microsoft built in uh, uh, the Windows ML and the Windows RT APIs, uh, right? So all this is is happening for a reason. And also, the next question you have to have is what does what does AMD what does AMD do? 
uh, both in the professional side and in the gaming side. Are they going to be able to have a, a ray tracing accelerating component to their next GPU already that's you know scheduled for next year? Um, will the 7 nanometer version of Vega that they have announced but had really only targeted for deep learning enterprise applications, will they decide to put out a, a consumer version of that because they can implement some of those same AI capabilities and features in that mm -hmm. product? It's going to make the rest of this year really, really interesting um, from, from a graphic standpoint, even though all indications are right now, NVIDIA is the only one that's going to put out new parts for, uh, for these markets. We wait with bated breath. I love some of the comments on this story. Uh, my personal favorite being the second one. It is a niche product so developers can get familiar with the architecture. The real deal will be made using 7 nanometer lithography. Yeah. <laughs> I am so curious to see what's shipped uh, next week. Because, I mean, one of the things uh, we talked about last week is that a lot of manufacturers, uh, a lot of vendors seem to have a lot of parts inventory right now they still haven't exhausted their inventory so having the 1170 slash 2070 slash 1180 slash 2080 whatever they're going to be called uh dropped into the market right now if those pull there's a lot of ifs in this sentence uh, if those polish benchmark numbers for the supposed 1170 slash 2070 are legit uh and it's uh amongst other things spanking a 1080 um if it's anywhere near traditional uh uh, or current 1070 pricing, I feel like the entire market for the 1070 and, and 1060 and 1080, for that matter, will practically vaporize. Um, yeah. I'm curious. I really am. You'll be there. PC Perspective will be there on site in yep. Germany. Excellent. We will. I look forward to it. Keep an eye on PCPro.com for the latest. Is that announcement going to be Monday, or is that something you're allowed to speak about without ninjas I honestly dropping through the ceiling? Okay. I don't know if it's Monday. It's either Monday or Wednesday, or or actually it could not be either of those. They could NDA it after the fact, but I can't imagine they would bring us all over there to a public show and not announce something. So I expect it to be. I would, if I were guessing, I'd say Monday. One of the thinner announcements we've seen uh, at Intel Graphics tweeted out, we will set our graphics free. Pound SIGGRAPH 2018. Uh, powered size and cost haven't constrained us from history. Um, it's interesting. They So here's a couple of things I'll say about this. That was this. a pained breath, if ever well, I've heard one. If you if you saw like headlines and news stories around this, it all talked about like Intel teasing Arctic Sound discrete gaming graphics card for the first time, or Nvidia or Intel spoils Nvidia's RTX announcement by teasing its upcoming discrete GPU, mm -hmm. and that was not the point of any of this this messaging. If you if you watch the video that we're showing on our screen now, they're talking about their developer relations. They're talking about how many integrated graphics chips, you know, they have shipped. They're talking about their driver increase, you know, their improvement and increase in investment in software and drivers. They're talking about, you know, supporting unique new APIs. And then at the very end, there's like a flash that says, oh, and in 2020, you know, it's just the beginning. We're going to set our graphics free or whatever the hell that means. Uh, and right. there's like a, there's just a silhouette of a, of a discrete add-in card of some kind. I don't know if people suddenly thought that Intel, even though they're not going to have a discrete GPU product until 2020, would already have their cooler and industrial design finalized or something. Yeah, that. Uh, so first of all, if one, it doesn't look like anything. It just it could it could literally be an SSD, <laughs> PCIe S add an SSD for all we know. Um, but it is what it does represent is the beginning of. Intel's attempt to message and tell the story about graphics, it has it has a lot of right. uh, a ground it needs to make up, right? To can, we haven't had a new competitor in the discrete GPU space in like 20-something years, 25 years. And even though they're Intel and they have a lot of money and a lot of really smart people working there, you're not just going to be able to like step in and immediately be a leader in that spot. There's a whole lot of develop, dev rail work that needs to be done. There's a whole lot of uh, uh, community investment that needs to be done. And this is, you know, the beginning of that education program. So they have a Twitter account. What can I say? There you go. 
Now, now we know. <laughs> Pardon the inappropriate intensity of laughter there, but uh, yeah, it's pretty much all you can say. There's a thing happening at SIGGRAPH 2018. Um, yep. So then we've got uh, Intel's foreshadowing, uh, L1TF, and you're going to have to sort of translate that for me. Um, I can't translate it much more than that. This is another security vulnerability, another side channel access security vulnerability yep. that just popped up this week. Um, AMD made an announcement saying that they don't believe that their architectures are uh, uh, can be uh, affected by this. So How? it's 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 another it's a just it's another one of those things. And I think it's interesting from a coverage standpoint from people like us and people in the media that cover this stuff that the after Spectre and Meltdown, after those two dramatic announcements. There have been probably a half a dozen other smaller ones like this that have occurred that have gotten way less attention and way less, um, you know, uh, uh, thought, I guess, around right. them. They, they, no one seems like before when Spectre Milton happened, it was like, oh, is Intel going to have to go out of business? So they have to recall all these G CPUs or they can do all this. Um, and then they had a data center event last week where they announced that their next generation Xeon parts would have hardware mitigation for side channel exploitations like Spectre and right. Meltdown. So the, the obvious question is, does that address this? Does that address everything that was announced post Spectre and Meltdown as well? Or does that, are we going to have to, every time we see one of these, it's another generation ahead before we see some hardware mitigations for it. So it's something that I've got some questions into Intel. Obviously, they don't really want to talk about it, but they are willing to talk about it. They're being as open as you can expect them to be about some of this stuff. So this one is centered around hyper-threading being enabled with virtual mm -hmm. machines. So, you know, another kind of, it's another step of abstraction away from just oh you know a hacker got on your machine and you're and you're and you're screwed so um i'll look more into this and and see what there is to to make of it but i just i just want kind of wanted to bring it up and and right. keep people aware that this stuff was still happening and like the date on this was the 14th so two days ago as we recorded yeah so. it was uh speaking of uh, uh uh hackers being into your stuff and you're screwed um we just got back from uh, uh, DEF CON, uh, Janet and I. And, you know, two of the biggest things that, that turned out at DEF CON is, is uh, certainly at Caesars Entertainment, possibly at other locations, they've come up with some new security policies in the wake of the shooting in 2017, the mass shootings. And uh, one of the ones that they're going to do a wellness check, and this got really interesting. If you're the kind of person that goes to Las Vegas, puts the do not disturb sign on your door and leaves it there, um, you know, uh, security policies. There's a, a good Ars Technica write up on that. Um, mandates uh, room searches uh, when staff has not had access to rooms for over 24 hours. And I understand the theory of the thing, uh, but the execution was a little um, flawed, to say the least, including. Uh, you know, people being woken up, uh, several women uh, either having uh, been walked in on while they were changing, uh, mm -hmm. having people in questionable, like, is this person really from security? You know, uh, is this shirt and them yelling and pounding on my door enough to actually uh, let them in? Um, especially in one case, I guess she didn't answer the door fast enough. And they started screaming and pounding and, uh, and she's trying to call down to the front huh. desk, to try to figure out some way to verify that this person is actually from security and not a, you know, a rapist yeah. or a, a robber. I mean, cause you know, you've spent a fair amount of time in Vegas. Things get a little squirrely sometimes. Yep. Um, you know, and of course this is DEF CON where, where privacy is a big deal and they were supposed to do a visual inspection and then leave. Uh, and in many cases, uh, people found that their things had been moved or things had been taken. For example, uh, uh, I think there were several reported cases where people's lock picks were taken, uh, which is a big, uh, mm. physical security being a big part of DEF CON. Um, and that was just, uh, 
you know, uh, you, that that was flat out scary, and I think that's going to get uglier and uglier, especially given the amount of concealed carry that goes on uh, by people visiting Las Vegas. I just don't see this working out well. If they don't figure out a, a better policy on that. Um, but uh, you know, it's uh, you know, CryptoWire, for example was reporting that uh, a staggering number, like millions of Android devices, uh, have flaws baked into the firmware that are exploitable uh, in the sense that somebody could lock your device, take screenshots, listen to your microphone. Asus LG Essential, ZTE, um, you know, basically it would require an app, download an app, no additional permissions, uh, and it would... Uh, uh, it would actually root access. Uh, Google basically says, this isn't Android. This is uh, uh, how manufacturers implement changes to code on the devices. Um, White Scope and QED Secure Solutions uh, revealed that Medtronics, they'd fixed a number of uh, problems with Medtronics uh, pacemakers, um, but there are several pacemaker models that uh, can still be controlled remotely <laughs> so that uh, the attacker can deliver additional shocks or deny uh, necessary shocks. Um, uh, Apple's device enrollment program turns out they could actually, uh, it's a, a system for pre configuring uh, uh, laptops, for example, or their mobile device management. Um, turns out the certificate pinning. Uh, that happens when the laptop is connected and pings to get uh, the enterprise account doesn't actually happen during installation. Um, the download doesn't get verified. Some malicious code could be installed that's actually fixed in Mac, uh, Mac OS High Sierra 10.13.6. Trend Micro. So Crestron devices, the big screens and monitors you see in stadiums and, and oftentimes in, in uh, uh, airports and stuff. Something like 20,000 of them are out in the wild uh, running on Android, which uh, allows you to uh, turn them into eavesdropping devices, <laughs> which is kind of silly. Um, but, uh, you know, they're un basically they're unsecure or they're insecure. Uh, and uh, the touchscreens could be used to actually remotely turn on a webcam or record audio, which is kind of weird. Um, and of course, the big news, which a lot of people have probably seen by this point, was the boating village. Where, uh, amongst other things, the one that really got all the hype was that an 11-year-old was able to change election results on an imitation of a, a state uh, 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 website. Um, National Association of Secretaries of State uh, basically was like, this DEF CON work is unrealistic. There would be layers of security. There would be all of the things in place to prevent this from happening. They certainly wouldn't have physical access in a room with a whole bunch of people. Um, but... What's interesting is, is some of the voting machine manufacturers did have reps there who were learning uh, what they needed to patch. Because whether or not uh, someone thinks these devices will be secure or that will be implemented in a secure manner, uh, as it so often happens, um, things are much less secure than people realize until they are hacked. Um, so on one hand, I think there was a lot of FUD being sowed. And on the other hand, um, there's a tremendous amount of work, I think, uh, that needs to be done to secure uh, uh, these boxes just because it's a good idea to secure them. Um, you know, because poll workers do a phenomenal job of maintaining things, but they shouldn't also have to be worried about uh, remote attacks uh, on systems. So, um, yeah, and I get where the idea that these boxes in a corral with people having access to them isn't realistic, you know, but a SQL injection is a SQL injection. It's just how you get it to the machine uh, or if you can. And uh, just patch your code, people. Somebody points out an yeah. exploit, fix it. <laughs> you know, just delete, expletive, fix it. And then it's one less thing to worry about. Um, this was interesting. Um I kind of read through this a couple times and just thought about it a lot. Um, so ARM reveals a roadmap and essentially that they're targeting Intel performance. Um, man, um, Josh wrote this up for PC Per. Um, you know, uh, and he kind of sums it up. Quote, ARM has had a pretty fascinating history, but for most of its time on this earth, it has not been a very public-facing company, which uh, in Josh's uh, mastery of the subtle understatement um, is a polite way of saying arms hid their crap pretty freaking well until they were damn well ready to, to publicly face it. Um, and that's just the way they operate. And if you don't like that, uh, deal with it. Um, you know, and, and you know, uh, uh, you look at this slide uh, that was under embargo until, you know, 
6 a.m. Pacific today. And, uh, you know, this is uh, two generations of products from the company that are intended, quote, to compete in not only the cell phone market, but also in the laptop market. And yep. uh, this is a big deal, um, especially. I think it is. Uh, you know, we've we've heard a lot of noises lately um, that uh, you know the that uh, Apple is going to take their I don't know a twelve a thirteen a fourteen a seventeen a twenty whatever number they decide to throw on it, but the idea that they're going to start kind of bringing uh, the Mac platform to ARM based processing, which I have a lot of mixed feelings about um, for any of a number of reasons, um, you know, but. What we do know is that, yes, those are Apple processors, and yes, Apple bought a company that's really good at accelerating ARM technology, and that's why their processors are so fast. And, of course, they're Apple, so they have a metric ton of money to throw at the problem. Um, but this also implies that ARM itself is working on significantly more powerful processors and probably consuming more power than we've traditionally thought of uh, in ARM processor computing to make it more powerful. Not that you know a 5-watt Intel processor is really sucking down that much juice, but... I'm very curious to see where this ends up. And this has to be, you know, this is, I, I can't read this as anything other than a direct shot across the bow of Intel. Um, it I mean, it definitely <laughs> is. It definitely is. And the the interesting thing is, so we had learned about the Cortex A76 a little while ago, a month ago or so. Uh, but now, you know, ARM is not just talking about that. They're talking about their seven nanometer uh Deimos and Hercules parts, maybe going down to five nanometer, and they've got a whole roadmap of this stuff kind of laid out, going against Intel in this space. And if you look at if you look at the first versions of the Snapdragon on Windows devices, the Windows on ARM, um, mm -hmm. the 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 primarily the two complaints are the performance wasn't quite good enough and application compatibility. ARM right. can't really fix application compatibility necessarily, uh, but they can give more reasons for Microsoft to want to fix that by releasing parts that are more performance, right. that offer more features, whether it be LTE connectivity, 5G connectivity, uh, super extended battery life compared to Intel platforms that will kind of force, you know, as user demand goes there, Microsoft will have to, will have to react. So, um, you know, the ARM compute, I mean, they've been increasing... This is this is and you know a, a, a basically a blanket statement that they're that they're not happy with the trajectory they're on and they're going to increase it. And this doesn't just actually go against Intel, uh, but it also kind of goes against Apple, which ARM won't ever say because Apple's a partner. Apple right. uses an ARM architecture license. But if you look at all of ARM's partners in like the Android space, whether it be Samsung or Qualcomm or MediaTek, mm -hmm. they've fallen behind Apple in the processor arena for mobile devices. Because they all have all been dependent on ARM's cores. Well, Apple right. was developing its own and Qualcomm used to develop its own, but they kind of stopped doing that three, four generations ago. Everyone else was dependent on what ARM was doing. And that gap in single-threaded performance, you know, continued to accelerate in Apple's favor. And I think they were getting a lot of, uh, uh, they saw a lot of problems with that from their partners. And so this will also address that, right? So, right. um it it will it will give them the capability to keep up with Apple in that space, even though they have been they've been falling behind. But yeah, I'm really excited what this what this is going to do for those those Qualcomm Snapdragon powered Windows machines or ARM powered Windows machines, whatever you want to call them, um, in maybe late next year, mid to late next year, right? Mm -hmm. So it it could be that quick if uh, if everything on these roadmaps lives up to what they say. We wait with bated breath. I don't know what else to say on that one. And I know I yep. abuse that line a lot, but this is, you know, uh, you know, if 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 these can actually run Windows, I mean, I I, I keep looking at that one chart where they're where they're going to Cortex A seventy six laptop class performance. Uh, now this is you know spec in two K six, so this is not a real world benchmark, but you know they're they're. Stacking that up against the Core i5 7300U and a Core i5 7300U in turbo mode, and uh, uh, they're basically saying they're faster than the baseline of that 7300U, and they're faster or they're a little slower than uh, the the turbo mode, um, you know. But consuming five watts instead of 15 watts that the turbo mode uh, 
consumes. Uh, and that, that Core i5-7300U, that's a 15-watt part that came out in Q1 2017. That's, man, if they can get Windows running on that, uh, it's going to put a hurt. It's going to put a massive hurt. If they get Windows running on that and 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 they're doing that level of power consumption, that level of performance, um, it's going to really suck to be Intel in the mobile market in a year or two. Um, they're going to have to react. That's yeah. what we want. Yes, because that's actually usually really good for consumers, yep. which yep. we happen to be when we're not talking about this stuff. Um, <laughs> I want to give a shout out to... Uh, we review it on on next week's tech thing, um, but uh, uh, I uh, my my Motorola G6, what I've been using, uh, a loaner that we had in for testing, um, uh, spent the weekend with uh, uh, lost and found at the uh, TSA in Oakland Airport. Um, how it went from my boot to lost and found, I still haven't quite figured out. But you know, it was secure, untested, and and you know, there was there, I didn't do anything. It wasn't taken from me. I think I, I set it down and and didn't pick it up. But uh, it afforded me the opportunity. That's a G6, an amazing uh, Moto G6 is an amazing two hundred fifty dollar phone. And uh, yeah, I'd like it. I like. I wish the European version was available in the U.S., which has uh, sixty four uh, gigabytes of. Uh, uh, or I want to say I want to say like six gigabytes of memory and sixty four gigabytes of storage. The the US G six is like three gig of memory, thirty two gigabytes of storage. Um, but uh, it's a really nice phone for the money. But I ended up uh, running down to Target in Las Vegas because nothing says party like hitting the strip mall in Las Vegas. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I like my Las Vegas adventures. Um, and I picked up a Motorola E four, which is I want to say is a uh, at least a year old at this point is uh, pretty common in, in Target and a bunch of other environments. It's one hundred and thirty dollars, two gigabytes of RAM, a uh, Snapdragon four hundred and twenty, which is a quad core processor. Um, you know, so compared to the G six, has three. Uh, I want to say three gigabytes of memory and an, uh, an eight core uh, Snapdragon four hundred and fifty. Um, the the camera compared to the the G four I, I used for about a year a couple of years ago. It's amazing how much better a considerably less expensive phone, the camera is. Um, performance was more than enough for most of the stuff I did uh, uh, at, uh, well, most of the stuff I was doing. I'm not editing video on this phone. I don't uh, play a lot of advanced games. Um, security updates are still available. It will not be moving past uh, Nougat to uh, to the next version of uh, Android. But I was actually surprised at how usable a $130 phone is. Uh, and I wouldn't have said that a couple of years ago. And, uh, but, you know, if you're looking for an entry-level phone, uh, you know, <laughs> or you're pointing your child and, and their, you know, uh, their earnings towards their first phone purchase, uh, the camera on it's got some really interesting interpretations of the color green uh, and flesh tone. Um, but uh, I got to say, I was shocked at how usable it was. Like the only the only place I had any power issues with it was for some reason, LastPass was a little glitchy. It would hang, um, you know, if I had a whole bunch of stuff open. But uh, I just was amazed at how usable a $130 phone is. And, you know, just for fun, uh, Shannon and I put the uh, pictures, we did some selfies with... Uh, the E4, the G6, and the Pixel 2 XL, and shock, uh, you know, it's amazing how much better the camera is in a $1,000 phone, um, but it also is amazing at, at how usable the cameras are now at that super entry-level mm. price point compared to where they were even a couple of years ago, so just wanted to give a shout-out on that one. Oh, my goodness. Uh, so you're going to be in Germany next week. I am. Will you be doing any special events next week, or are you just going <sighs> to see all the things? You know, drink I mean, some no beer, eat some Nvidia's pretzels, had, play Nvidia's some games. having an event there, right? So we'll <laughs> right. have an event there. I don't know. Other than that, I don't know. I'll go wander around and look at churches and stuff. As one does. Yeah. What city is it in? Cologne. Ooh, beautiful city. Flying Snow into Frankfurt, Berlin. taking the train up. So goodness i've been to frankfurt another pretty city ladies and gentlemen you uh 
you must enjoy hard work because you're still listening to my voice uh, or you're a huge fan of Ryan Shroud or maybe even like me. If you got a hard work question for us, we live for them. Tweets at Ryan Shroud or at Patrick Norton. Uh, and uh, do us a favor. Keep listening to the podcast. And uh, We mentioned it earlier, but if this is your first time listening to This Week in Computer Hardware, a.k.a. Twitch, you can go to twit.tv slash twitch and get links to download uh, or just search for it on your favorite podcatcher and uh, – do us a favor. Tell your friends if you're a fan. We're always looking for more listeners to expand the universe. Because eventually Ryan Indeed. plans on controlling the universe as we know it. And, uh, mm-hmm. I'm mm-hmm. a little more laid back. I'll just take a small section of Wyoming. <laughs> That'd be good for me. Oh, my goodness. PCPer.com is a place to find more of Mr. Ryan Stratt. You can find me at T-E-K-T-H-I-N-G techthing.com or avxl.com. Uh, AVXL is a podcast I do with Mr. Robert Heron. We talk about home theater and audio and love to have you stop by and check it out. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Ryan Stratt. We'll catch you next week on Twitch. Twitch.